In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of Your Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we note so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27, verse 48. Matthew 27, 48. While they were waiting to, around to see if Elijah would appear, Jesus said, I thirst. Immediately one of them, and Matthew doesn't record who it is, but it is uh, John, ran and got a sponge, filled it with cheap wine, put it on a stick. I don't know what, uh, it's actually a measuring stick. I don't know what they say in the King James, maybe a reed or something like that. But put it on a uh, he put it on a stick, filled it with cheap wine. That's because that's all they had there uh, was that uh, cheap wine. We had the cheap wine with gall, which was a narcotic agent that they tried to give to our Lord, but he wouldn't take it because he wanted a clear mind to go through with it all. And then at this point, after he had been uh, judged for all the sins of the world, now he says, "I thirst." And that's because of the extraordinary pain he's just went through and that his physical body is actually thirsting. So John, the one who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation, uh, he immediately ran and got a sponge, filled it with cheap wine, put it on a stick and offered it for him to drink. And uh, this was probably John. And uh, in this case, he probably did drink it because at this point he's about to uh, die physically as he has already uh, died spiritually. And then 2749, but the rest said, Get away, let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And his spirit, by the way, went into the presence of the Father. And uh, our Lord's body went into the grave of Joseph of Arimathea, as we will see later. And his soul went into Hades, or Sheol. And that's what is, uh, the King James calls it the underworld. Well, it's split into two parts. We have Sheol, which is uh, torments. And we have uh, uh, Hades, or, or excuse me, we have Hades, which is torments. And we have Sheol, which is Abraham's bosom or paradise. And that is where all the Old Testament saints went, uh, to paradise, which is actually at the center of the earth. They didn't go to heaven like uh, we go to heaven today. They went to the center of the earth, which was paradise. And then, and then on the other hand, we have Sheol, the center of the earth, which is, uh, not Sheol, but Hades, which is the center of the earth, and that's where people went for torments if they hadn't believed in Christ. And so what we have here is something unique because the soul of our uh, Lord Jesus Christ, actually our Lord Jesus Christ is trichotomous and in this uh, unique event uh, we're going to have his soul going to uh, Hades which, uh, but it's the compartment of Hades that is called Sheol and that is uh, specifically known as Abraham's bosom or paradise and he, this is where the Old Testament saints are and he's going there to proclaim victory. So uh, unique. this is unique because this doesn't happen to us. We just, uh, our soul and our spirit and uh, uh, go straight to heaven. And then at the resurrection our body goes uh, straight to heaven, our new body. And so if the resurrection occurred tonight at 9 o'clock, uh, our resurrection body, our soul, and our spirit, spirit all would go to be in the presence of the Lord. But in this case, because of the uniqueness of what our Lord is going through, uh, He has to go, point one, He has to go make an announcement uh, to those in uh, Sheol that He has had victory. 
And so Abraham and all of those there get to hear that uh, our Lord had victory that day. And that is uh, the importance of the reason why it's all split up like this. And uh, the difference is, and it's simultaneous, and we know this from Luke uh, 23, uh, 43 and 2346, that this is a, a simultaneous event in which both the soul and the spirit and the body, all of which are separated. The body goes into the grave, of course, and it goes into the grave of Arimathea. Then Jesus cried out in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Now, what we have here is we have to understand that this is the physical death. And he said it is finished, tetelestai, before his physical death even occurred. I mean, even to speak, you, you can't be dead and speak. So he's alive and says, tetelestai, it is finished now with results that go on forever. And that means that salvation was finished for us and procured for us and all the sins of the world were imputed to him and judged in his spiritual death. And that's what occurred when he said tetelestai. And then once that was completed, he said, I thirst. And then after he said, I thirst, he, he uh, screamed out in a loud voice and gave up his spirit uh, by his own volition. See, and this is unique as well. We, we can't uh, command our bodies to die. I mean, we can shoot ourselves and do something stupid like suicide, but we cannot uh, command our bodies to die. But this is what our Lord did by giving up His Spirit. And He does this after He had completed the work on the cross. So the physical death is secondary. The spiritual death is primary. The spiritual death is what brings to us our salvation. The physical death is something that had to occur. It's secondary. Just then, in 2751, just then, that means immediately after our Lord uh, died physically, the temple veil was split in two from top to bottom. Now you have to know something about the temple veil. The temple veil was enormous. It was 30 feet wide and 60 feet high. It was an enormous curtain, and it veiled the Holy of Holies. And it veiled the Holy of Holies because no one could see the Holy of Holies. And what our Lord demonstrates in splitting this veil right in two and just opening it right up is that in the temple there is nothing. Nothing was in the temple. Nothing was in the Holy of Holies. He is the Holy of Holies. And nothing was there, and this was a sign to the Jews. And this was a sign we're moving on to a different age now. This temple is, in other words, Jesus Christ is saying, I'm the temple, this temple is meaningless. And he split the curtain right down the middle, 30 feet wide, 60 feet high. And this just uh, shocked the Jews. Because in there, they always thought of the Holy of Holies as something wonderful. And nothing was there. It revealed absolutely nothing to them. It also shows that they were veiled and they had a veiled hearts and that they couldn't see that Jesus Christ was the Savior. And he splits the veil right in two and says, hey, look, nothing's there. You've been relying on the temple. You've been relying on your religion. It's gone. It's over. And soon your country's about to be split in two and destroyed And so this is a, actually a foreshadowing of the fact that we're going to have the unique spiritual life and the temple's not going to mean anything. So the, the splitting of the temple veil assigned to the Jews. Then the earth shook and the rocks were split apart. That was assigned to the Gentiles. The Gentiles didn't care about the temple. The temple veil being ripped apart and looking inside and seeing there was nothing. It wouldn't have shocked them at all. They, of course, there's nothing there. We built it for you. and We never put anything in there to start with. And uh, we know there's nothing there. But then when the earthquake occurred and the rocks were split apart, that's what impressed the Gentiles. So there was a sign here, uh, both for the Jews and the Gentiles, that something phenomenal had just occurred. And it was a gracious sign. Of course, they shouldn't have needed it, but uh, 
It was a gracious sign and some of the Jews will believe and some of the Gentiles will believe as well. Then in 2752, now this is a great Halloween message since we're getting close to Halloween because this really did occur. 2752, tombs were also opened and the bodies of many saints, these are Old Testament saints, who had died around Jerusalem, were raised. Now that, this is something that uh, if you're really into empiricism and saying, well, how does that happen? How does this happen? Well, it's a miracle, and this is what happened. The bodies of many Old Testament saints were raised. Now they were, they were not resurrected, they were resuscitated. And they were resuscitated for the reason of uh, uh, it would be a witness to the Jews. And all of these uh, dead people rise up out of the tomb and just start walking around. Now they don't look ghostly and ghastly. They come back as, uh, as they were in their uh, perfect health or whatever their peak was in life, their mental peak. And uh, they walk around as Old Testament saints and uh, some of them recognize these Old Testament saints and say, Hey, look, there's so-and-so walking around. But he's dead. And this is unique to Matthew. None other of the Gospels record this, but it, it, it did happen. And the tombs were also opened. Whether it happened at the same time the earthquake or not, it doesn't uh, really say because uh, Matthew is not always chronological. And if you like to uh, follow empiricism, you might want to say to yourself, well, the earthquake happened, opened up the tombs, and then they came out. But that's a miracle in itself. You don't have to have an earthquake for God to raise up people from the dead who are uh, going to be not resurrected but resuscitated. And remember, the only resurrected person today is our Lord Jesus Christ. 2753, they came out of the tombs and went into the holy city and appeared to many people after his resurrection. So this shows that this, this was a tremendous uh, a time, a unique time. And we don't have dead people raising up today. That's because we're not living in during the time in which our Lord was crucified. This is a unique time. And this is our uh, Lord Jesus Christ giving everyone an opportunity to see just how unique a person he was. And that they must believe in him as the Messiah. And so a lot of these things are going to occur because remember the entirety of the Bible has not yet been written. They don't have the assets that we have today. And when the, the temple veil was ripped, it was a point of doctrine. He was saying, look Jews, there's nothing there. Your religion, nothing. And when the rocks were split apart and there was an earthquake, he's saying, look Gentiles, I am the Son of God. And when uh, the dead came up, as not as resurrected, but they came up in resuscitation, that was saying to the Jews, look, this is unique, he's the Son of God. And it was their last chance. And so the uniqueness of our Lord's uh, uh, death and resurrection all comes to a head here. And this is uh, so that a maximum amount of people uh, will, who will see it, and some of them will change their mind and a lot of them will not. A lot of them will see all of these miracles and still not change their mind. A lot of Gentiles will see the complete darkness, they'll feel the earthquake and they won't even uh, think about believing in Christ. And a lot of the Jews will see the dead people walking around and they won't even think about believing in Christ. And the same thing's going to happen in the tribulation where there's going to be tons of signs and wonders and miracles and yet they still don't believe in Jesus Christ. They had Abraham and the prophets and they didn't believe. So none of this is going to make them believe. Yet a few people do come around to believe in Jesus Christ. And in this case, we have in 2754, we have the Gentiles responding more than the Jews. The Jews see all this happen and they still want to uh, reject him. And they still do reject him. Most of them do. Especially the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Now when the centurion of these soldiers were with him who were watching Jesus, 
They were all standing around watching Jesus. And the Greek word watching here means that the concept of this verb is to watch something that belongs to them. They're starting to take it to heart, in other words. They're starting to say, hey, this does apply to us. And these are the same Roman soldiers, by the way, who were cruel and would beat people and enjoy it, just like they beat our Lord and enjoyed it. And by the way, they weren't all Romans. The Romans uh, hired people sometimes, especially for the third-class province. So these uh, soldiers were from pretty much everywhere, but all of them were tough and they loved abuse. And they were sick in that way and they abused our Lord. But now they're taking note about something. Now when the centurion, that's the leader, and those soldiers with him, the centurion was Roman. Roman. The soldiers with him could have been from anywhere. They were like mercenaries hired who were watching, who were watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place. They were extremely terrified and said, Truly this one was the Son of God, and actually this means they've changed their mind right then. Right then they've changed their mind, they've believed in Christ, and they've said to themselves, truly this one is the Son of God, and there's probably about 17 of them right there watching it. And they all believe in Jesus Christ. 2755 Many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and supported him were also there watching from a distance. Now the women just so happened, uh, the disciples fell all apart. Maybe for the exception of John, he fell apart for a bit, but he got right back with it. Uh, But all the disciples, the men disciples, they fell all apart. And now we have uh, the women who followed Jesus. They're there and they're watching it. 2756, and we get a listing of these women who were there. And these women were much farther along doctrinally than any of the men at that time. And the reason why, well, women are responders, and they responded to our Lord Jesus Christ as the perfect Son of God. And uh, and their response was so great that uh, they were just going to follow Him all the way till the end. So we have among them Mary Magdalene. We have Mary, the mother of James and Joseph Jr. And the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Well, we remember the mother of the sons of Zebedee. She would be a perfect Mother's Day message. It was Salome. Remember, she was the one wanting to know uh, if her two sons could sit at the right and left hand of God the Son, which was out of line, but uh, her intentions, and uh, we of course sincerity is worthless, but at the time she was very sincere as a responder and her intentions were good, but she was out of line doctrinally. But at this point uh, she had apparently learned enough that she was just going to she wasn't scared of anybody and she was going to stand stand up there along with Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and uh, Salome was going to stand there with them and watch the crucifixion, crucifixion of our Lord and watch what happens after that and just be completely enamored with it uh, while all the others are scared and terrified. It was the women at this it was the women during our Lord's time that really took an interest in the word of God. And the only explanation I have for that is because the women are responders. And uh, maybe at that time they didn't have good marriages, so instead of responding to their husband, which they they, uh, completely responded to our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know one was a prostitute, didn't have a husband. Uh, Of course, uh, she stopped being a prostitute. It took her a while. She was caught in the act, the very act of adultery. We'll study that at some other point. Uh, but uh, Mary Magdalene here, a prostitute, former prostitute, and she had such a response toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Eventually, she left that lifestyle behind once she learned a lot of doctrine, and she becomes a beautiful token of grace. And she does move to maturity. And by this point, she's uh, near maturity. And she knows that our Lord's going to be resurrected, etc. And she's going to see all of this occur. And she's going to try to convince the disciples, hey, he's been resurrected. And then we have Doubting Thomas and all of that. 
So the women here as responders uh, seem to follow the Lord the most. Now it doesn't always follow that way all through history, but it did in this case. And the women uh, had that special compassion. They were just going to uh, watch it. They were going to be there for the Lord. And they had uh, and they had been listening to the Lord, and they'd been piling up doctrine in their souls. And they uh, they were the better. They were the better half. Really, the men really failed in this case. But these women were remarkable. Now we have Jesus' burial in 2757. Now when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea. He's also a member of the Sanhedrin named Joseph, who was, and the word was means that day he became a disciple of Jesus. He had believed in Jesus Christ that day. And apparently, he thought that uh, before that day, he, he thought he was dying. Because he had made his own grave already. And he was a rich man, so he cut his own grave out of a large stone. And he was going to make sure that he was buried in a, an upright place. Or some place that was grand. Because he was rich, and he was going to do that. He said, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to pay for a grand burial. And that's what he did as an unbeliever. But then, when he believed in Christ, he said, you know what? This grave is going to be for our Lord Jesus Christ. So he had a change of mind right then, that day, and became a disciple of Jesus. Then 2758, he went to Pilate, and the reason he could go to Pilate so easily is because he is a rich man. He's well known. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered that it be given to him. And of course Pilate would order it. Pilate gets a lot of tax money from this rich man. He's going to say, all right, whatever you want. So Pilate ordered that it be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. These are the death clothes. 2760. And placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut in the rock. He had cut his own new tomb out. He must have been sickly or thinking he's about to die or something. But before he died, he believed in Christ. And he might live another week or another month. The Bible just doesn't say. But he apparently thinks he's dying and he might be very ill at this point. And so here we might have a deathbed type conversion. And so he says, you know what, forget my tomb that I just bought and cut out of the rock. Let me give it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he rolled a great stone in the door of the tomb and went away. 2761. Now Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. And they were so interested, they're following Jesus Christ, even his body, to the tomb. And they're very interested in what's going to occur. And we, right now, we have no mention of Peter. We have Peter before talking all the time, talking out of his head all the time. Well, Peter's probably still crying in his beer because he had uh, or betrayed the Lord. So he probably still hasn't recovered from that event just yet. And here are the only uh, people left opposite of the tomb, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And they're there, and uh, now we have the guard at the tomb. And they watched uh, Mary, and Mary Magdalene watched the whole stone be rolled in front and everything. And they just sat there. And they were probably pretty depressed at this point, but uh, they loved our Lord, and this was the only way they could express their love was to just sit there and look at the tomb. 2762, the next day, this would be a Thursday, the next day, which is the day of preparation. That is, how, that is actually what it should say, following or whatever is just wrong. The next day, which is the day of preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees assembled before Pilate. So they had to swallow their pride again to get some type of thing from Pilate, whom they hated, and Pilate hated them too. But because of the crowds, they uh, tended to uh, agree at this point. And they said, and they had to swallow their pride when they said this, and said, Lord, or leader, or whatever, 
uh, and then said Lord. They never came to call Jesus Christ Lord, but they could Pontius Pilate. So they swallowed their pride and said, uh, Lord, we remember that while that deceiver, they're talking about Jesus Christ, Lord, we remember that while that deceiver was still alive, he said, after three days I will rise again. And then and now they're ordering Pontius Pilate around once more. But we've noted his weakness and uh, he's washed his hands of this and he's ready for it to all be over. And so he's just going to do whatever they say. So give orders to secure the tomb until the third day. The third day would be Sunday. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal his body and say to the people, He has been raised from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first, or worse than the first. Worst is in three cases. Two cases will be worse than the first. So they were afraid that our Lord would be resurrected and then the rumor would get started and it would be worse and they thought that uh, these disciples would uh, carry his body out of there. But uh, we note that the disciples are nowhere around. They're not near his tomb or anything. They're all depressed right now. The only people around there are Mary Magdalene and Mary. None of either of these are too weak to move that big uh, tomb anyway, and or that big stone in front of the tomb. Too weak to do that. And so now um, they ask for the soldiers. And then twenty seven sixty five. Pilate said to them, "Take a guard of soldiers." Go and make it as as secure as you can. In other words, he just gives them a whole guard of soldiers and says, Hey, go. Take these soldiers. They're his soldiers. Take these soldiers here and go secure that tomb. And he leaves it up to the chief of the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees. So you're going to know they're going to try to, they're going to do it in the best way possible. Something else you need to know about Roman custom. If you ever fall asleep on duty, they burn you alive. So there's no way uh, they're going to fall asleep on duty. And yet uh, this is going to come out of this. But uh, if you're a Roman soldier and you're on duty and uh, you happen to nod your head and your leader sees that, he takes a torch and lights your clothes on fire. Now that will wake you up in a hurry. But that's not it. If you wake up in a hurry and just put yourself out, they're going to still parade you out naked in front of the people and humiliate you and then kill you. They really trained their soldiers to be the best in the world and that's why they lasted for a thousand years. There's no soldier going to go to sleep on the job when they know that if they go to sleep, the penalty is death by fire, which is painful. And so they, the, the best soldiers are there and they're going to go guard the temple. Or not the temple, but guard where our Lord is in the tomb. So they went with the soldiers of the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. That means uh, they uh, did uh, certain things to make sure that it was sealed up correctly. And uh, they reinforced it, in other words. Because remember, Joseph of uh, Arimathea, he just rolled a big stone in front of him, a big heavy stone, apparently. And he may have been sick, but he was still strong enough to do that. But they sealed it and stood around it. And nobody was going to get through there. Nobody. And there's no way. You can't put a, a guard of Roman soldiers in front of something and think the disciples are just going to come up and take out the body. Not going to happen. And then, of course, uh, we'll study the doctrine of resurrection because this is what is going to happen, but we won't study it tonight. But we'll move on with the verses. And this is what's going to happen is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And without the resurrection, by the way, there would be no salvation. Without Him going to the cross, there would be no salvation. Some people, uh, even today, don't believe in resurrection even though they believe in Christ and they're way out of line doctrinally. There's going to be a resurrection of all the saints just as our Lord was resurrected. And we've been given the same power through the filling of God the Holy Spirit. So there is just no doubt about it. There's going to be a resurrection. When it's going to be, we do not know. But there is going to be one. It's imminent. It's going to occur. It's going to happen. It will happen. It's just like they said, Hurricane Wilma will hit Florida. And then you see that thing just meandering out there and you say, how do they know that? 
how do they know it will hit Florida? And you see it go over uh, the Yucatan Peninsula and mess up Cancun. And then uh, all of a sudden there goes the right turn, boom, hits Florida. Well, isn't the concept here is that the resurrection is going to occur. How do we know? Because Scripture says so. And Scripture is far more reliable than any forecast, even though they got it dead on that time. So 28.1, now after the Sabbath, just before dawn on the first day of the week, Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. They're still in their frontal lobe. What are they thinking about? Jesus Christ. They have their eyes on the Lord all the time. They're not thinking about anyone else, anything else. Whatever little sleep they're getting, and they're not getting much because they're getting up before dawn. It's dark outside and they're going to the tomb. The only thing on their minds is the Lord Jesus Christ. This indicates maturity. And they had it. And they had it then and they would have had it today. You see, you say, but uh, Jesus Christ was there at that time and all this just happened. It doesn't matter. There's just two of them. So there were very few who were actually mature, very few who were occupied with Christ, but we see here that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary are occupied with Christ. They're not thinking about anyone else, just wondering about the Lord and what's going to happen. And they've heard the doctrine of resurrection, so they're looking forward to it, but uh, at this point they're very emotional as well because they've just lost someone whom they love very much. There's a lot of emotions mixed in, mixed in here as well. But that's uh, normal because they've lost the, the Lord Jesus Christ as they see it in their minds. And at that point, 28.2, And there was a severe earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled back the stone and sat on it. He just rolled it back and sat on it. And just uh, It kind of indicates a, a relaxed mental attitude. The angels have a relaxed mental attitude. Just rolled it back and sat on it. 28.3 His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow, and the Greek indicates it's almost transparent. I guess it would almost look like a ghost, but it was an angel. A transparent uh, appearance like lightning, very powerful, and uh, white as snow, sitting on the, the tomb which he rolled away. And the guards became like dead from fear. The guards became like dead from fear because they were so afraid of him. Of course they're afraid of him. And that's way outside of their frame of reference. They've never seen a, uh, a man. They think it's a man, but it's an angel. And they've never seen anything like that. Just a haul away, a tomb that they had sealed for sure that could never be broken apart by any man. But here comes an angel. Boom. Pushes it aside and sits on it. And they're dead with fear. Of course they are. That's just uh, outside of their frame of reference. And they were afraid of him. But the angel said to the women, remember the women were still sitting there, they saw it too and they got afraid, it's outside of their frame of reference. Now this type of fear from the women is not sin, it's outside of their frame of reference. We would all get scared if all of a sudden an apparition of bright light and white clothes were to appear in front of us. It would be outside of our frame of reference and we would uh, probably have a heart palpitation or two and wonder what was going on. And that's what the women did. And then the angel said to the women, Stop being afraid, because I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. And notice the angel names the humanity of Jesus Christ. Does not name the deity. He does not say you're looking for God the Son. He says you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. His humanity. And it was his humanity that did all the work. And it's his humanity that is resurrected, not his deity. Humanity is resurrected. 28.6 He is not here because he has been raised, just as he said. In other words, the angels give these ladies a point of doctrine. He's not here. He's been raised, just as he said. He's been resurrected. He said he was going to be resurrected. He's resurrected. 
come here and see the place where he was lying. So he's going to let them look experientially. And the angel is. And the angel's going to say, hey, come here, look. He's not here anymore. And the angel is apparently very relaxed and very glad to be doing this and pointing this out to these women. And notice there's two women going in there. Peter's not there. John is not there. None of the disciples are there. Of course, Judas is dead. He hanged himself. But none of the others are there. Except two women. So two women get to, to witness the fact that Jesus Christ had been resurrected. And so if you're a lady and uh, you think uh, doctrine's for men, you're wrong. Doctrine's for women too. It's for everybody. And uh, and then you say, but uh, this stuff is a little bit... Uh, well, it has to do with response. And they responded to the Lord and He was perfect and that's why they could respond to Him so well. But it has to do with the fact He was a good teacher and they responded to the doctrine. And in this case, it just happens to be that two women did the best job at it. Now later on, a lot of men are going to follow them. And uh, But uh, sex, of course, is not an issue in learning the spiritual life and we've noted that from Galatians. We're all equal when it comes to growing in grace and in knowledge. Now we have a different uh, status in life when it comes to the fact when you get married, the woman's under the authority of the man. But the woman under the authority of the man can go all the way to maturity while the man remains an idiot. And it doesn't matter that you're in the status of marriage and it doesn't matter that you're under his authority. In fact, that can sometimes motivate some women to get moving even faster because uh, it's the only way they can deal with the butthole at home. To grow in grace and in knowledge. And that's what they do. And so they're able to deal with it and switch to impersonal love. And so these women were remarkable. And 28.7, having gone quickly, tell his disciples... He has been raised from the dead and is going ahead of you. And the indication is he's about to drag their feet and going into Galilee. Having gone quickly, tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there. I have followed my instructions and told you. The angel followed his instructions and he's saying to them, follow the instructions that were given to me and uh, follow them. And go quickly and tell the disciples. So again, I'll give it to you if you're looking for the translation. Having gone quickly, tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead. And this thing beeped at me again. So having gone quickly, tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there. I have followed my instructions and told you. 28.8 So they left the tomb quickly with awe. And the concept here is still occupation with Christ. They were awestruck. And they knew the doctrine of resurrection... But when they actually saw it in progress and they saw it with their own eyes, they were struck with awe. So they left the tomb quickly with awe and great joy. They were happy about it because they knew the Lord was alive. And uh, they knew He had died. Now they know He's still alive. So they're happy. And ran to tell His disciples. Then in 28.9, they get a treat. But Jesus met them saying, Greetings. In our language, it would uh, be like uh, Jesus Christ is coming down. Hey, how you doing? Greetings. Hello, how are you? And they came to him, fell down and clung to his feet, and worshipped him. Now this is after the resurrection. And this is also recorded in John twenty eleven through 17. And this is after the resurrection. And uh, they see the Lord Jesus Christ and recognize him and fall down and uh, worship him and cling to his feet. So he's a body. He has a human body. It's in resurrection form now. And they can cling to his feet. 
Then Jesus said to them, Don't get excited. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and they will see me there. So again, another command, go to Galilee. And he had issued it through the angel. Now he's issuing it himself to who? The women. He met the women along the way. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. The brothers refer to the disciples. Notice he calls them brothers because they're in the family. And uh, even though they're idiots, they're in the family. And the only people there are the women. And he tells the women, now this is something else, the women are going to have to go up to these men who had followed Jesus and Peter who thought he was so great and tell them, hey, Jesus is alive, go to Galilee. And the women are going to have to tell them that. And uh, they're not used to women telling them to do anything. It, it was a cultural thing then, and it's a little different now, but then the women just didn't tell men what to do. But uh, they're going to do it. Good, because Jesus told them to, and they will see me there. Now we move on to the perjury of the guard. And Matthew doesn't necessarily go chronologically. He, uh, he just uh, shifts subjects here and there. Other uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, not epistles, but other of the Gospels go in chronological order for the most part, but Matthew, he doesn't. 28.11, while they were going, some of the guard, that's the Roman guard, went into the city and told the chief priest everything that had happened. In other words, they went to the chief priest and they said, this uh, freaky thing came down and moved the tomb and he sat on it and we were scared to death. And then uh, the freaky thing let the women go look inside and Jesus wasn't there. And we've never seen anything like this. And besides, they're terrified because they're in danger of being killed now because they didn't follow their orders and complete their duty. Uh, the tomb was opened. And uh, the, what, the, what the Romans would say is, oh, you're lying. You all went to sleep. You all had a big party and went to sleep at the tomb and woke up and it was opened. But they're not lying and they tell the chief priest everything that had happened. And after they had assembled with the elders, they formed a plan and they gave the soldiers an enormous amount of money. They're going to buy them off telling them, You are to say, His disciples came at night and stole His body while we were asleep. The possibility of them doing this is uh, on their own without a large sum of money is nil. They're not going to admit going to sleep on duty. As I told you, Roman custom, they kill them. They're gonna, they'll burn them alive. That's a Roman, Roman, the Romans wouldn't allow it, and the penalty is very harsh, including death, going to sleep on the job like that. But uh, they gave them a lot of money, and, and by the way, they also had connections, so they're going to keep them out of trouble as well. So they give them a lot of money and just say, uh, tell them you fell asleep, and we'll take care of you from here and go away. And, in other words, and don't tell this story to anyone, please. That's what they were most worried about. 28.14 If this matter is heard before the governor, he will satisfy him and keep you, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. In other words, if uh, you are accused for falling asleep on the job, in other words, somebody asks you what happened, say you fell asleep. And if you're accused by the governor, in other words, if it goes up into the higher ranks, and somebody says, what do you mean you fell asleep on the job? That's not allowed. Then uh, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. How? Money. These religious people were good at bribery. And so he's saying, look, I give you all this money. And uh, if you get in trouble with anybody, you let us know and we'll pay them off as well. And you'll, you'll be just fine. Just don't tell anybody this happened in this way. 28.15 So they took the money and did as they were instructed. It was a large amount of money and uh, they did exactly as they were instructed because not only did they like the large amount of money, but they also liked the fact that uh, they wouldn't be in trouble. 
and that these uh, chief priests and Pharisees and all these are going to keep them out of trouble. And so they, they, they thought the plan was good and said, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, go on with that. And this story is told among the Jews to this day. And that is to this day means to the day that Matthew was writing this in the uh, 60s, not 1960s, but 0060s. Mm-hmm. And it was told till that day. And all the Jews said the same thing. All they fell asleep and the disciples came and stole, it, stole the body of Jesus. Even though they sealed the temple and all that, they would rather believe that than to believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. So what we have here and what we've studied is the fact that our Lord has been resurrected. And uh, we will study this, the resurrection, in more detail tomorrow night. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we might come to glorify you, and we might come to have the tremendous faith that uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and also Salome had. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.